Welcome to the Two Pages of Mystery podcast, now part of the Coil Entertainment Network. I'm your host, Rob Steele. I want to make sure that everyone understands the purpose of this podcast is to get your story published. Send me your short stories, I'll turn them into ebook versions for the website, and audiobooks for this podcast. Like I said, not this episode, but a future episode of the podcast. And then you can send all your and then you can send it to all your friends, all your family, say, hey, look, I've been published. How cool is that, right? Send everybody to the website, two pages of mystery.com. Even before you send me your story, let everyone get an idea of what this is about. The more people involved, the better. And I would like to point out that on the website, two pages of mystery.com, you can buy the hard copy book. It's not a hardback, it's a paperback. But you can buy it from Amazon and Barnes and Noble. There's links all over the website. Check it out. It's the first 23 stories that are being put in this book. And if you want to be part of Two Pages of Mystery Volume 2, send me your stories. In the meantime, I would like to thank iTunes, the Google Play Store, and the Happy Hour Network for passing the show along. And now on to today's story in which Lieutenant Cooper Wright gets caught up in a web of religious intrigue when Christian protesters are believed to have attacked the creator of a pagan reality television program. This story is called Bristle Moon. But Daddy, you have to get her autograph. She's only going to be at the convention for about an hour, and I love her so much. <sighs> What are you going to do when your daughter says that to you? You find a way to get the autograph, of course. According to the website, Felicity McEnhall is going to be at Kamapalooza Con, but only for about an hour at noon. She's just passing through on a way to voice another character for a new show. But my daughter is so enamored with Master Peahen and the Chicklets that if Master P herself is going to be in town, she wants an autograph at least. I think it's a bit cruel that the only time she can show up is the opening Thursday when the kids are in school, though. I don't remember being this enthralled with a voice actor when I was growing up. I mean, Frank Welker and Mel Blanc were the only ones I knew. Who voiced Speed Racer or Space Ghost? I have no idea. But Felicity McEnhall voices Master P. Hen... My daughter knows that, therefore I must get off work. She only had one other request of me this morning. Don't find her dead, Daddy. That would break my heart. I know working homicide isn't easy on the family, but hearing her say that just broke my heart a little. I vowed then and there, raised my hand in everything. Honey... I, Lieutenant Cooper Wright, will do my best to not find Felicity McEnhall dead. Will that do? She nods and gives me a hug before grabbing a backpack and running off to get on the school bus. She's growing up so quick. Anyway, 11.30 rolls around, and thankfully, there hasn't been anything big happen today. No homicides, no open cases at the moment. I think I'll take a long lunch and get my kid the autograph she wants so badly. The convention center isn't that far from the office, and I think to myself, I can take my time. What's the rush? I don't know what the hell made me think that. Thinking that way usually brings a meteor crashing to Earth and it gets labeled as a homicide because it was signed by some supervillain living in a hollowed-out volcano that has just appeared in the middle of town. Comic Palooza Con happens every year, and each year it gets bigger. It started out with just comic books, but now it includes television programs, movies, musicians. Hell, there was a politician last year trying to get votes from tourists. As I approach the convention center, I can tell this year it's bigger. There are lines stretching out the door. I check the website that's still loaded on my phone, and with it being the first day, I didn't realize it didn't start until noon. I guess the question becomes, do I get in line or do I cheat a bit? I go for the cheating. I don't want to spend all day here. I make my way around to the VIP entrance where the big stars enter the arena, and I'm greeted with a sight that I do not want to behold. There's an ambulance, 
lights flashing, paramedics wheeling somebody away on a gurney. Don't know who it is, but that can't be good. I also notice Officer Scott Walker, who also notices me. Lieutenant, that was quick. I'm glad you're here. Come on. It's over here. Wait, what? Scotty, what what are you talking about? I start to follow him down the hallway. You're not here about the call? Nope. But I will probably get the call any... Seriously, LT, that's your ringtone? Let me guess, you probably got a flip phone to go with it. Scott, bite me. After listening to him complain about my choices in cell phones, I answer mine. And sure enough, it's the chief telling me to get to the convention center. There's been an attack. I explain that I'm already there, and he asks if I'm a suspect and if he should send someone else. This had started out to be such a good day. No, sir, I just got here. I'm with Walker now, and he's briefing me on it. I don't get an immediate answer, and I look at my phone. The chief hung up on me. Swell. Well, you heard me say it. Brief me on what we got here. A terrible thought runs through my head. That wasn't Felicity Mackenhall, was it? I mean, she's the reason I'm here. My kid really wants her autograph. No, sir. I don't think she's even here yet. Hang on a minute. Why are you here? The mayor said to put some extra security on the show. There's a lot of protesters here over the whole Bristle Moon thing. Boy, if I knew what you were talking about, that would be really helpful. Well, as I understand it, there's a new TV show called Bristle Moon. It's about witches and witchcraft and Wicca. It's not really a fictional TV show, though. It just informs people about what paganism really is. So, of course, the Christians are out in force claiming they have the one true religion. We already had a fight with them this morning when two groups claimed to have the one true religion. That was fun. So what's your take on all this? Well, First Amendment, freedom of religion. If you want to be Wiccan, who am I to judge? And if you want to protest, that's covered too. I think it's a waste of time and does nothing to further your cause, but hey, go ahead. I smile at that. I nod my agreement and follow Walker out of the hall and into a dressing room. I have to admit, I wasn't paying that much attention, and this might just be the same room Pupples was killed in last year. Regardless, Walker fills me in on what's happened. The creator of Bristle Moon, L. Bloodwood, was found unconscious, slumped over her laptop on the table of the small room. A glass of what looks like wine next to a computer. The scene was rather violently disturbed when she was found as three people did a rotation of giving a CPR, which looks like it might have saved her life, but it made such a mess of the room that it's almost useless as a crime scene. There was one other thing. She was the reason for the increased security. She's been getting death threats, signed Rhea Dion. Problem is, we can't find anyone with that name in the entire country. Well, that sounds fun. I guess she was writing a new episode? I ask, gesturing to the still open and powered up laptop. Walker leans over the screen and starts reading. When all is said and done, it comes down to the cold, sparkly hand of the inevitable juggernaut of fate. That's when... Hey, LT, where are you going? To check with catering. We should actually get some wine and crackers to go with that cheese. Again, my humor seems lost on the audience. Actually, since I don't see anything obvious here, I'm going to go see if any of the stars of the show are here and question them. You stay here and guard the room till CSIs get here. Walker nods and I head deeper into the chaos that is Kamapaloozacon. I check my watch and there's still 15 minutes before the doors open. But then I'm told that it's been open for two days to other convention participants. You know, the booth people. I suppose this is the convention proprietor's way of being nice and making sure that you get to see other booths and exhibits, even if you're running one. And there is some interesting stuff to look at here. Old comics, new comics, artists, actors. It's not long before I find the Bristle Moon booth. Manned by, if the poster is any indication, the show's two stars, Penelope and Martin Janice, the husband and wife team of pagan priests on the show. When I first noticed the booth, I also noticed the rather embroiled in a rather loud argument with Phil and Mike Roberts, the creepy twin creators of Stegosaurus Christ, that bizarre, allegedly Christian cartoon that tries to teach kids that Jesus Christ and dinosaurs live together on the planet at the same time. Scientific proof be damned. Yeah, them. Thankfully, I haven't seen them since the whole Pupples incident. 
quick flash of my badge and a stern look reminded them of who I was and where I could throw them for being a public nuisance. And the creepiest twins I ever met beat a hasty retreat. They grumbled and continued to complain as they walked away, though. As I've said, I'm not terribly religious, but I do remember there being this thing about doing unto others. It would be nice if some televangelist would preach that for a change. Thank you. Penelope began. They've been hounding us since the show started. We try to be nice, but everyone has their limits, you know? Unfortunately, I do. I formally introduce myself and inform them of Miss Bloodwood's condition. Do you know of anyone who would actually want to hurt her? I mean, you know, besides the creepy twins? Usually protesters are harmless to other people, but you never know, right? Well, Martin started to say something and swelled his chest out as if it was something important. Then, his expression clearly stated he really didn't have anything to say. He looked to his wife for assistance, but her expression said, No, you started it, you finish it. Well, I got nothing, really. Gee, thanks, that was helpful. I didn't say that out loud. I wanted to, but I'm a professional. A few more minutes of conversation revealed that they didn't even know about the death threats and knew less about Miss Bloodwood. They had hired her through an agency, which they claim is a typical thing, but that she'd come highly recommended. She'd worked on other shows before, like Amish Apprentice, Mormon Wizards, and America's Most Eligible Amputees. That didn't mean much to me, since I'd only heard of two of those shows, but had never watched either. They did supply one good piece of information. Her mother was in town for the convention and staying at the Marlin Hotel. Not the one near the convention center, though. The one on the south side of town. They didn't know why, though. Half an hour later, I'm at the south side Marlin Hotel front desk asking for the room paid for by L. Bloodwood. I'm told she got one of the suites, 1720. She told the front desk that she would be staying there with her mother and her mother's new husband. This would be something of a honeymoon for the new couple. Taking your daughter along on a honeymoon, especially if she's grown, seems a bit weird to me. But nevertheless, I catch the elevator to the 17th floor. I've never been in this building before, but it is rather nice. The south side being a bit more posh than the rest, I still didn't expect a hotel with this kind of detail in the woodwork. And every few feet, there seemed to be a nice portrait of some bigwig in town, past or present. When I get to room 1720, I catch the happy couple on the way out. At first, I think this is not going to go over well. To my knowledge, no one has told her that her daughter was poisoned. It's at that point I realized I don't even know her name. I have to start the conversation with the ever awkward, Excuse me, but are you L. Bloodwood's mother? I introduce myself for what feels like the billionth time today and explain the situation. Thankfully, someone has beaten me to the punch and she and her new husband are on the way to the hospital. As I escort them to the lobby, I ask a few questions, such as, Do you know anyone who would want to hurt your daughter? Are you aware of the threats she's received? And just for the report, what is your name? The answers are two-thirds unenlightening. No one she knew would want to hurt her daughter. She was unaware of the threats, and her name was Agatha Alvis. Her new husband, who looked to be about 20 years her junior, was named Owen. The enlightening part was when she revealed her name history. Of course, that's my married name now. Before that, it was Faraday, and before that, Dion. That name caught my attention. Dion, as in the person who'd been threatening her? Do you have another daughter named Rhea, or a cousin maybe? Oh, honey, Rhea Dion was Elle's birth name. She changed it when she turned 18. Said Elle Bloodwood is such a romantic name for a writer. I think that's all hogwash. There's nothing wrong with Rhea Dion. Could that be it? I thank Ms. Alvis for her time and wish her the best of luck on her new marriage and head back to the arena. When I arrive, Officer Tim Fay, Homicide's personal IT and all-around good guy, is going through the video footage. Good to see you, boss. I found some footage you might like. He adjusts a few knobs on the video equipment. See, here's where Miss Bloodwood goes into the room at about 11. This guy we haven't identified yet brings her a bottle of wine about 11.05, but he just hands it to her, never enters the room. And no one else does either until they discover the body at 11.40 or so. Tim, you just showed me exactly what I was going to ask for. This wasn't a murder attempt. This was a suicide attempt. I don't know if it was a publicity stunt, but those threats she's been receiving were from her. Elle Bloodwood is Rhea Dion. She'd been setting this up for a while. 
I think I'll let the DA figure out what to do with her, though. I heard on the way over that she'll be in the hospital for a while, so we have time. Time? Why does that mean something to me right now? Time? Uh, oh, no. Tim, what time is it? Here's a generational gap marker. Tim looks at his phone, and I dread the answer I know he's going to give. Got about 3.15. Why? Maybe she isn't gone yet, I exclaim as I start to exit the room, but Tim grabs my shoulder, restraining me a bit. Boss, one last thing. This is from Scott. He hands me a manila envelope, the big kind with the string. He said you were looking for something like this. I undo the string. I have never actually had one strung up this much before. And open it to find an 8x10 photo of a rather good-looking Japanese woman with a signature to my biggest fan, Felicity Mackenhall. Officer Walker appeared in the doorway. I figured since that's what you were here for, it wouldn't do to have you not get that. Besides, I know how it is with kids. Kids get upset. Then the mom gets upset, and all of a sudden you're sleeping on the couch. We can't have that for you, can we, LT? I hope you enjoyed the story. If you have any comments, questions, or want to submit your own story, contact me through the website, twopagesofmystery.com, or just email me at 2pom at steel42.com. I've been Rob Steele, and you've been listening to Two Pages of Mystery. So until next time, keep them guessing. <laughs>